Well, if you're a Lewis Hamilton fan, welcome back. Seems like he's got his mojo back. I've seen some very interesting things, particularly into turn nine, which I want to share with you. The old Lewis Hamilton seems to be back. The tight line wrestling the car around the track. He topped FP1 and FP2. So this is a swing in mentality here, which we need to keep on top of as we head into 2025. If you're interested in my Friday practice analysis from Las Vegas, definitely keep watching. Welcome back to the channel, guys. We are going to talk about the Friday practice sessions at Las Vegas practice one and practice two. Before we do, I just want to talk about Max's mentality because we didn't get a chance to touch on that in our live stream yesterday. And he's come out in the press saying, yeah, I just need points. I'm just happy if I do get points and collect points, then everything will take care of itself and all good. So that's exactly what we said, the mentality that Max needs coming into this weekend. But he has had a shocker of a practice, uh, practice one and practice two. And you can see when the car's not where max wants it he gets very frustrated and like he's an emotional person he's an emotional driver so advice from here on in would be just keep it together max and i'm sure he will but this is what i would be saying just keep it together let the weekend and play out is still like a long way to go it's like he'll, he'll definitely be there come qualifying tomorrow he just needs to like detach emotionally a little bit and if he collects like we said in the live stream yesterday if he collects third fourth fifth it's good it's still all good for him and he can still save the championship. What you don't want is to throw the car in the wall out of emotion. I'm sure he won't do that, but um, it's worth worth mentioning that he wasn't happy with the car today. Let's talk about Zach Brown because they had him on the uh, on the panel like they could switch. Sky Sports could interact with him during the practice sessions and they asked him like what he thought about Brazil. And it was an interesting question from Rachel as well. And Zach reiterated that they couldn't have done anything more in Brazil and that they did the best they could. And again, I'm like, oh. So again, following on from the live stream yesterday, like the mentality of McLaren is creating a mushy, mushy environment for Lando to be in. So I just want to share with you a quote or a saying that I, I've actually heard recently, which is really interesting. And it says, Genetics deals the cards, environment plays the hand. And it's really interesting. It fits perfectly from McLaren because the genetics deals the cards piece is McLaren have a good car, Lando's quick, should be raining wins, 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 poles and fastest laps. But environment plays the hand. And the mushy, mushy environment and mentality that's happening in the engineering team McLaren is what you know these are the guys that are not playing the cards properly they're playing bad bad choices with their cards so i thought i'd share that with you because it aligns with lando's mentality zach zach saying oh there's nothing more we could have done you know it is what it is sometimes you get lucky sometimes you get unlucky blah 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 same stuff that lando's saying and culture starts from the top guys so i wanted to highlight that to you as well now rachel brooks who was asking the questions to zach live in the pre, uh, live in the practice session said something like so does that mean you need to take more risk then if you're going to be challenging for a championship in the future and similar to crofty like we said yesterday she's having a go like trying to get mclaren to wake up and like do something you know don't just sit there and and die pretty much and she's 100 percent right like it's not about taking more risk but it's just about mclaren recognizing that they've made they've had bad weekends and made mistakes so until they self-reflect and realize that they need to improve they will not be world champions you can take that to the bank i promise you that so um a lot of drivers complaining about the pit entry in the early phases of practice one um i feel like it was a bit of whinging to be honest like They'll work it out where it is. I mean, it's practice. Just find where the line is and eventually you'll work out where it is. Eventually you get familiar with your braking zone and what gear you're coming in there at. So you might be halfway through fifth gear when you need to start braking. And I don't know, it was just a typical F1 thing. So I'd, I thought I'd call that out as just being a little bit of whinging. But uh, let's jump over to the practice one results and have a look at them together now. So there you can see the practice one results on the screen in front of you and a surprise to see Mercedes up there, to be honest, the one, two. We didn't expect that uh, in our live stream yesterday. I didn't expect that at least. I thought Ferrari would have the upper hand because it's a circuit largely dominated by mechanical grip. You need good traction. You know, they were pulling back you. They won Monaco. So anyway, let's see how this weekend plays out. But 
Mercedes looking very strong and crucially it's Hamilton with the upper hand so obviously since Brazil something has sparked that reassurance interesting to see both the Mercedes guys doing 21 and 20 laps on the medium compound tire that's great data you know that's uh, only beaten by 24 laps there Oscar Piastri down in P8 and I'm going to show you the difference between Hamilton and Piastri's racing lines as we go through a little bit as well but Lando look at that nine tenths back so a lot of work that needs to be done for for mclaren if you just look at the first practice session let's have a look at the top speeds and see what went on there as well and we can see checo perez number one and verstappen number three so red bull have got the upper hand with straight line speed that's good for them in terms of raceability it's easy to defend with straight line speed it's easy to attack with straight line speed it's just handy to have if you can have it uh, the Mercedes 340 there for Hamilton P6 and 337 for George Russell. Um, and the Ferraris down there as well, 12 and 14. So that's probably the most significant story. I didn't expect them to be that far down. Also, given where their lap times are, it's pretty consistent. But signs 331, it's a good 11 Ks down from Sergio Perez. So we'll have to have a look at the FP2 results when we get around to it. But uh, those are the FP1 speed traps. Now let's talk about why Lewis Hamilton was so good and where he was finding some of the lap time. Well, Lewis Hamilton, we've spoken about him a lot on this channel, tight line driver. What does that mean? He won't explore edge to edge. And if you get a little bit of problems on entry, like entry understeer or entry oversteer, which we seem to be getting in this low grip track, the tight line just helps do away with all of that drama. So I'm going to share with you some pictures now and demonstrate what a tight line is. I'm also going to share a link in the description of this video, short corners versus tight lines, so that you fully understand what a tight line is. So let's have a look at Lewis's line into turn nine. That was the most impressive thing for me. And we'll have a look at it now. So hopefully you can see that on the screen in front of you. This is a picture that I took from my television, but this is coming out of the chicane seven and eight into turn uh, turn nine here. You can see on the bottom right, it's turn nine. And this is the crucial part here is the space that's being left across here on the, on the left of your screen. He's not finding this white line before turning. You can see the yellow glove. He started to turn in from mid track here. This is classic tight line Lewis Hamilton settings. He's one of the only drivers on the grid that does this. I've seen Leclerc do it a little bit. I've seen Franco do it a little bit as well. But I've like Lewis is the pioneer of this. So if we have a look at, say, Oscar Piastri in FP2, for example, have a look at this. This is the total opposite, right? This is wide line. This is going as far to the edge of the track as you possibly can in order to open up the corner and get the most turn in. And you can see that there's dramas, right? He's got all sorts of issues, like all crossed up, all sorts of oversteer on entry. This was a few corners before this, I think, was turn seven. Um, but differences in techniques that need to be observed there. So Lewis and Oscar, like they're, Lewis is, like I said before, Lewis is one of the only drivers that drives the tight line. Most of the drivers will try to do this and play edge to edge. Max does this a lot, for example, as well, but he didn't seem to have any issues out there of, of this kind. There was a lot of lockups in FP2, but we're going to get onto that in a minute. But I thought I'd just share that with you to say that this was the excellence of Lewis Hamilton. It was also really interesting to see that just as they went out for the first first few laps in FP1, Orlando had a little snap there into turn 11. That's where he crashed last year, right? So I said on Cameron's channel, I think that um, that snap was due to the car bottoming out and when he crashed last year. Basically what happens is it's bumpy in that area and with a full tank of fuel, uh, you know, the weight can move up and down quite a lot. And when it goes up, then the momentum, it comes down and then it, the plank sort of touches the floor and you bottom out like physically. And what that does is unload the tires, relieves the tires of their grip and then the rear slide. So that's classic bottoming out. So that happened again in the opening few laps here uh, with Lando Norris in turn 11. He just corrected it, but it could have easily been in the wall in exactly the same way. So they've got to be careful of that. This is classic McLaren, like not making the same mistake twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times in the case of Lando Norris's start. So they've got to like start to look at these things deeper and say, because I think that maybe they washed it off last year as, oh, that can happen, unfortunate, whatever. Like, no, there's a reason. That there are reasons for these things that are happening. You've got to dig into it. So it was interesting to see his car 
same driver, same corner, same car, everything same. He was the only one that had a swap there. So it could be to do with Lando's line, I think, into there. He might be getting the worst of that bump, whereas other drivers maybe are just fractionally going around it slightly. Anyway, I thought it was interesting to call out that it wasn't coincidence and that it was Lando again, and it could have something to do with their line. The telemetry comparison for FP1 is going to be Lewis Hamilton versus George Russell. Let's have a look at their two best laps together now. All right, hopefully you can see that on the screen in front of you. So we've got George Russell's 35.3 in white and Lewis Hamilton's 35.0. This is the corner where the tight line was the photo that I shared with you before. So it's, you come through this chicane and instead of bringing the car all the way across here to the right, like up against the wall for best entry into the left-hander, Lewis just goes straight to the apex. Like he doesn't bother with opening up the track. So that's the tight line. So guess what? Lewis is aqua and look just where it flashes aqua there. That's exactly. So I saw that picture I saw that live on TV, but it's interesting to see it show up in the data here as well. Also on the entry here, this was the photo of Oscar Piastri. It's also interesting to see that on the entry, it's also Aqua. Um, so this is where I could see from the, uh, from the TV where I thought Lewis was finding time through this area. And if we just click here and have a look at what the Delta does, anytime it goes up, that's in Lewis Hamilton's favor. Obviously, he ends four tenths quicker. So, and exactly through this part, actually George had the upper hand by two tenths and through that corner, Lewis has found, you know, it's gone from three tenths up to one and a half. So he's found four tenths in this section of track. So that is the tight line, my friends. Let's zoom in on it and double click on that. So you can see where we are. It's this white line here brings us here. And you can see with Lewis in Aqua, everything is being done earlier. So he's getting into the corner earlier by driving less meters and driving the tight line. Don't confuse this with short corner. Again, I've got a video describing difference in tight line versus short corner. Lewis is just saying, I'm going into the apex. Like I'm just going in, I'm all in, I'm just going in. Like I'm not gonna worry about opening up the corner, driving extra meters, dealing with any entry instabilities. I just wanna go to the corner. So he goes into the corner and he's braking and then here he's starting accelerating from this point here so that's a lot earlier than george right and that's when you see the delta start to absolutely fully switch sorry i've just made a mess of that uh let's go back there that's when you see that when lewis gets on throttle the delta start to fully switch in his favor and he's got speed all the way down the next straight until they equalize. Really interesting thing that I noticed here was have a look at this. This is down the back straight, the, the main, like not the main straight, the pitch straight, the back straight, the long Las Vegas strip. Have a look at this big separation in obviously Lewis getting a better exit. You can see, I'll just zoom in here so you guys can see this properly. Lewis with his better exit down that straight, he's getting more speed, but there's a point at which George like absolutely destroys Lewis down here. I'm not sure if that's battery or um, aero set, like downforce levels, but we saw the top speeds before in this session. Lewis was fine, so there was a time where he got good top speed. But it's just interesting to see that George's car eventually takes over Lewis's. So I'm wondering if Lewis has got slightly more wing on the car and George is just finding, and you see the Delta come back in George's favor. So that's interesting to see that maybe George is running a low downforce package. We'll have to have a look at how that looks in, in FP2. So uh, let's get onto that now. FP2 results hopefully you can see on the screen in front of you. So Hamilton topped the session again. Crucially, he didn't have any of the fastest sectors. So I thought that was interesting to call out. Lando got the best S2, the 31.2 there. George got the best first sector. And then Carlos got the best final sector. So that's also interesting given we saw the Ferrari's speed trap before wasn't great. But Lando in there now. So 0.011, that's as near as makes no difference, exactly the same lap time. But again, we see Hamilton 1 and Piastri 8. So Oscar needs to get into those apexes a little bit earlier, I think. Uh, a quick word on Franco. He looked like he struggled a lot in this session uh, just due to confidence with that car. Obviously, Alex Albon had the fuel issue. But a good job by Gasly there, P6, Hulkenberg, Magnussen, uh, Sonoda, Bottas, all those guys inside the top 10 there doing a great job as well. So let's just have a look at the speed traps and see what was going on uh, there as well and what's going on with the Ferraris. 
So hopefully you can see that on the screen in front of you. Well, Gasly 350 and Ocon 347, that explains why Gasly was P6. Uh, Norris has got a healthy top speed and Piastri as well. So that explains why the McLarens are up there. Verstappen and Perez, similar to what we saw previously. But again, the Ferraris, this is so strange. With their top speed, how were they getting the fastest final sector, right? We need to go back for one sec. This is Carlos Sainz here, 35.9. Final, I wonder if he got a slipstream, I'm not sure. Leclerc's here with the 36.1, which is only a tenth slower than the fastest guys, but this is interesting. I'm not sure what's going on here. I think Ferrari need to take a little bit of wing off, hey, and they should be fine um, and just see what happens because those top speeds are not great. So anyway, that's why we look at this data so we can get those sort of insights and see what's happening. But probably the, the key story for me is uh, the Alpines with some strong straight line speed. And if we just go back, there's Gasly and Ocon P12. So with Gasly's healthy straight line speed, he's only doing, only, I say only, but a 36-1. Um, it's just interesting. I don't know. So there's more to it than just that back straight. There must be the traction out of the final corner as well. Hamilton, Norris and Sainz doing a good job there. Assuming signs didn't have a slipstream, I'm not absolutely sure on that one. So a lot of lockups in this session. We saw Max go off a few times down there at turn 14, the final braking zone. Brakes just getting a bit too cold. Hopefully just he doesn't get frustrated with that and he can just say, yeah, it was a tough day, but we'll see how we go tomorrow. Lewis, a lot of lockups into turn one as well. He went off there a few times, but still managed to top the session. So he's obviously trying to find the limit there and I guess it's it's a good sign, like like I said at the start, if you're a Lewis Hamilton fan. Really interesting to see the delta on Franco's steering wheel was not present. We cut to a shot of him like inside the cockpit in the helmet cam, and you couldn't see a delta. So how is he supposed to know? Like how is he supposed to be trying different lines and seeing what works and what doesn't work? It's the most useful piece of information on the steering wheel. You don't care what gear you're in or what top speed you're doing or like some of the other things that show up there that are not necessary like who cares it's gear seven like you need to see the delta you need to see like whether or not you're doing a good job a better job and trying to find lap time with the delta if you could only have one measurement on the wheel it's the delta so it surprises me that that wasn't on franco's wheel Anyway, let's have a look at the telemetry comparison now for FP2. It's going to be George versus Lewis. I want to see what was happening with the top speeds there down the back straight. So hopefully you can see that on the screen in front of you. We've got Hamilton's 33.8 and George's 34.0. Oh, those, those were their best two times. This one here for Hamilton and this one here for George. Uh, let's have a look at the top speed. This is the section here. You can see in white, George has still got the upper hand. Doesn't look like it switched over, like George has carried or maintained whatever advantage he got on the exit, he's maintained that. And actually there's a point at which they almost converge, we're talking about 342, 345. So either George has come Lewis's way or Lewis has gone George's way. I think that's what's happened there in FP2. So interesting to see those sort of changes there. Um, we've also got a big Delta spike here uh, which is where Lewis found the two tenths of a second. Actually, if you see this delta running away, I guess it does mean George has um, less downforce on the car still potentially. This this is interesting. Yeah, on all of the straights. Yeah, George is still. Look at this. This is down the main down the pit straight, the main straight. Oh, is that the short back straight? Sorry. Yeah, that's the short back straight, the DRS zone. Uh, George has still got the delta running away. So. It, it does look like, actually, I have to go back on that. It does look like George has still got a lower downforce package. But look at Lewis under braking, bang, finding all of the time, two tenths in the final, final part of the lap there. So really interesting to see. Just keep an eye out on that. We'll have a look at the speed, speed traps in qualifying as the weekend goes on as well. Let's do our quick message to Argentina and Franco fans, and then we'll wrap up. Hola a todos. Ojalá que estés bien. Uh, Franco no tiene la confianza en serio de en esta, en esta pista pero bueno, él está aprendiendo es una pista muy difícil la cosa más importante que, que estaba diciendo antes era él no tiene el, el delta la diferencia del, de las vueltas vuelta mejor y vuelta que está haciendo en el momento no tiene el delta en, en la, la pantilla de, de la volante entonces, ¿por qué no? El, el, la delta es la cosa más importante 
para ver en, en el volante. Entonces, um, yo no sé por qué él, él no tiene en su volante. Pero bueno, uh, así vamos. Creo que Franco necesita mucha ayuda. No es su culpa. No es culpa de Franquito. Creo que es una culpa del, del equipo de James Wells y todo el equipo de los ingenieros. Um, Gaiten me gusta mucho. Él es un ingeniero muy bien. Pero Franco es muy joven. Necesito los consejos correctos con una persona como yo, con experiencia y que puedo ayudar. Pero anyway, um, de cualquier manera, um, creo que voy a estar una fin de semana muy difícil por Franquito desafortunadamente suscríbete a este canal mándeme una pregunta o comento debajo y vamos a hablar uh, mañana vamos a ver lo que él puede hacer that's all for this video guys sorry about all of the audio issues i am getting on top of it slowly hopefully by the end of this weekend it's all sorted but i hope you enjoyed the video leave me a question or comment in the comment section below and i'll see you after qualifying tomorrow cheers